I want to start with, this is going to be a story. And I want to begin with a question for all of you to think about. And that is that if you look back over your lives to date, all the way back when you were a child, when you were dating, when you were in college, your early work careers and so on, how many of you believe that your best days are yet ahead of you? When I give this talk to many, uh, the typical response in the room is about 35% of the room raise their hands and the rest do not. 15 years ago, I would have been firmly on the side of those of you who would not have raised your hand. And I have a story to tell about how that changed. The reason why this is important is because um, we have had a dramatically increasing lifespan over the many years, and that may well continue forward into the future. If you live the statistics of the lifespan these days, by the time you get into your 50s and heading towards 60, you still have a third of your life yet to live ahead of you. It begs the question, what are you gonna do with that third of your life? Because very likely, it's not gonna be what you did in the first two thirds of your life. And that is the basis of my story. I began my career in 1966. Many of you will think that's in prehistoric times. I founded one of the very first timesharing companies called Comshare uh, in, that, in the early part of that year. It was in Silicon Valley. Uh, there was a few others at the time. And I had a great time of running that company, growing it very rapidly. It was essentially what cloud computing is today, but called timesharing back then. During the course of about the first 10 years, we had high growth, but then I started seeing timesharing going in-house and we had to go through what today we call a strategic transformation. We chose to become a software products company. And that was a huge business model change for us. We didn't know how to do it at first, and we had to learn. And it took a bunch of years, and it took a lot to go through that transition. In final analysis, we did make that transition. 100% of our revenue went from timesharing into software products. And during that period of time, which was the 1980s, I had a great time once again. The, I was cover story on many magazines. Uh, we had a, a tremendous run of growth as a software products company, and life was great until it wasn't. 2001, the tech bust. Uh, very briefly, hopefully, we're facing a little bit of that today. Well, the tech bust had a big, big impact on me. Being a tech guy, uh, I had all my investments were in tech companies, including my own, and that, that got knocked down to the floor. It not only knocked down me financially, but also took me down from an emotional standpoint. I was a bit of a mess. Even my wife was uh, trying to find other things to do, but I certainly was not the greatest guy to have around if you were my friend. I was depressed, but I don't know whether you would call it a clinical depression. I was down as were many of my compatriots who were throughout the, the tech industry. That was a very difficult year. My wife decided something had to change. And while I was moping around, she decided we needed a dog. Well, she went out and researched the breed, all the different breeds, and she concluded, we're gonna get an Australian Terrier. This is about a 20 pound dog, which is uh, uh, not very big. Uh, although they're bred for the Australian Outback, so they're, they're tough, they're used to tough weather, and that turned out to be quite helpful as the story unfolds. She decided that she was going to try doggy things with this new dog called Emmy, a girl dog. She tried dog shows and Emmy won dog shows, but she was not interested in them. She tried breeding Emmy, and she had a litter of pups, some of which themselves became champions 
but she was not interested. When I say she, I mean Emmy was not interested uh, in that either. We started taking some hikes. We live in the Aspen, Colorado area, and we began taking hikes. There's plenty of places to go hiking. And what we started noticing is wherever we went, this little dog, Emmy, had to go higher. And she always found the highest point wherever we were, whether it was the top of a boulder, top of a ridge, wherever it was. And she did amazing kind of climbing antics to go higher. Nobody taught her how to do that. Somehow that was in her brain. And so I began to go with her longer hikes, higher hikes. It eventually got to the point where my wife decided this was getting to be a bit too much for her. She went and got another dog, another Australian Terrier, and went off and did doggy things while Emmy and I started hiking longer and higher. We used to go uh, for a while at, at the top of what's called Independence Pass, which is near Aspen. It's the second highest paved road in the United States. And at the top, you could see a string of mountains. They are the continental divide that's well known uh, around the United States. And we would hike around and we would always see in the distance, and you can see on the top left of your screen, a real mountain, one that has kind of a real peak, and wondered what would it take to get to that mountain. It wasn't very clear. There wasn't much documentation on it. We didn't really know. But one day, Emmy and I decided, which meant I decided she would go along with anything, we're going to figure out how to do it, and we're going to bushwhack across the, the, uh, the, the, the plants and bushes, uh, and then we had a boulder field to get across. She started showing me that there was nothing that was going to stop her. Even boulder fields like this, and worse, she figured out either to claw her way up it or how to solve the problem a different way and find little cracks to crawl through. I never really had to worry about whether she was going to catch up with me because it was always about me catching up with her. And she had this instinct, she had something in her brain that she had to keep going higher. Well, we figured out our way up that mountain and we got to its summit. At the summit of many of these high mountains, and this one, by the way, was 13,200 feet um, uh, of uh, elevation right there at summit that you're looking at. Yeah. It was a pile of rocks. The pile of rocks is called a cairn. And often, if there's enough room on a summit, they mark the summit. You can see a canister, the black and white, and that has a, a pen, a, a pencil, and something you can sign inside. And that allows you to uh, give evidence that you've actually gotten to summit. Well, when we got there, she climbed on top of that pile of rocks as though the summit itself wasn't high enough for her. She had to go right up on top of the pile. But then I saw her raise her head and look out horizontally from left to right, slowly scanning the horizon as though she was looking at the beauty. And I'm wondering, what is a dog thinking about who is doing that? Are they actually thinking about the beauty? Or are they wondering why is there no more up because all she wanted to do was go up? I didn't know, but in observing her, I started scanning around and looking. And all of a sudden, I felt a feeling come over me that was almost what I would call spiritual. A feeling that, well, that you get when you climb a mountain. And I started seeing in her a passion for doing this kind of climbing. And it began to transfer itself into me. For the first time in a while since that uh, March or April of 2001 with the, with the market bust, and this is not much further later, um, I started feeling some stirring passions in me that I hadn't felt for a while. I started thinking maybe this kind of mountain climbing thing is what we ought to do more of. But I had a problem. Standing right there on that summit, I was 63 years old. 63 years old. What was I doing thinking about starting to climb high mountains at that age? And furthermore, what was I think of doing it with a dog that small? But the passion had taken over from both of us. 
And it, that's what I wanted to do. And when I got back down off of that mountain, I told my friends, I told my wife, and what did they do? They all told me I was nuts. I was crazy. I wasn't going to be able to do it. I was too old. She was too small. Wasn't going to happen. Not only that, well, that mountain was 13,200 feet high. There's a bunch of mountains in the Colorado Rockies called 14ers. 14ers because they're 14,000 feet or higher at their summit. There's 58 of them. So there's quite a few 14ers. In fact, Colorado has most of the 14ers in the country. And they're all part of the, the Rocky Mountains. And I decided I'm going to see if I can do the work and figure out that winter how to get fit enough, even at that age, so that the next year we would go up and attempt a 14er. Emmy and I would. Well, we did. And I did the work during the course of the winter. And I chose a peak called Yale Peak. It's 14,199 feet at the top. This is a picture of us coming right off a of summit. So we did get to summit. And you can see it gets kind of rocky up there. Some of those rocks are loose. You got to watch out for them. When we got to summit, and by the way, it was always Emmy ahead of me. She obviously had no problem. I was pretty much huffing and puffing. I had with me my son at the time, so we were not solo. He was young, strong, no problem for him. As we started heading down, actually right after this photo, I tripped on those rocks. Didn't get too badly hurt, but it, it stung. And I started realizing that I was, I was really going to have to push it to get all the way back down this mountain. Well, I did get all the way back down that mountain. And I at first thought, maybe this is something I can't do. But what happened is my mind started taking over with treating this like a problem, like a challenge or a goal. And I started doing what I would typically do in business even all the way back in the days of the transformation with Comshear, which is to take a big problem and to break it down into pieces. How could I, what were the pieces and how could I solve them? Well, I figured one of the pieces was my weight, my body weight. As you can see, I wasn't exactly totally overweight, but I wasn't at college weight either. And I figured if I adopted a different kind of a diet, maybe I could knock 15 or 20 pounds off my body. Then I started studying what was in my pack. And it turns out that there's been tremendous progress in tech fabrics and tech materials where you can have lots of layers of clothing and other sorts of things and equipment that you need, but that are very lightweight. And I wound up being able to knock six or seven pounds out of my pack. Uh, I had a few other issues I had to resolve. I won't go into all of them, but I treated each one as an indiv individual problem went after it, got them solved, also did some additional phys physical work that winter. And by the next year, Emmy and I, together and solo, decided that we were going to go and try another 14er called Mount Princeton, which is not far away from Yale Peak. It's in an area called the Collegiates. And we crushed it. Now, this you can see the, the summit of the mountain way in the distance. It may look like those rocks that she's standing on get smaller and smaller. They don't. That is the perspective of going all the way back into the distance. So even from this photo, we had a long way to go, miles to go, thousands of feet of vertical, lots of rocks and boulders to navigate. But look how alert she was. And I want to tell you, by this time, I was as enthusiastic as she was. And we got to that summit. And I knew that this was something that we were going to start doing much more of. As we went on through the next several years, I roped in a few of my friends who were younger than me, stronger than me, or also climbers. And we saw some of the most amazing, amazing views. When you take a look at this kind of a picture, you think it's a professional photographer that took it, or maybe you think it's a painting. And it is what you see when you're out in these mountains. It, it grabs you, it fills you with, with inspiration and with passion. And that's a word that I wanna use a couple of times because passion in my way of thinking is the key to everything. Here's another view. This is a climb that we did uh, in September when the color changed, the aspens start uh, changing colors to, uh, to yellow and to orange and to reds. Unbelievable. 
This, you might think, is a botanical garden somewhere. No, it's just a field of wildflowers that we pass as we go on to another mountain. These are the kinds of views, and this is why it had the kind of impact that it did with me. As Emmy and I traversed and climbed these mountains over the next several years, together we climbed 16 14,000 foot mountains. And they're listed on the left as to, as to what they were. And every time we would head up a mountain and other climbers would see Emmy, they would say to me, how many times did you have to lift that dog to get to summit? And my answer, never once on 16 mountains. She had a commitment. Every dog has a little different personality, but she had the kind of passion, the kind of commitment that I then had as to how to master these mountains, how to get to summit. And you know what I found? I found that the kind of passion that I developed in doing, in climbing these mountains, transferred itself to the other activities in my life. And during the course of this, this space of time, I found that my business affairs started improving. I found that I was back being a leader again. While oddly enough, I was a follower following Emmy up mountains. Uh, my history was as a business leader, and I was back in the saddle again in a variety of positions this time uh, because my company had uh, a while back uh, before this been sold. Well, it got to a point where Emmy, the next year, was going to be 12 and a half years old, going to be too, too uh, old to be able to do this kind of, uh, this kind of work. And it wasn't right to try to take a dog up these mountains. Plus, the mountains were going to get harder and harder. Some of them turn into uh, rock climbs with exposure, much more difficult. So it was time to retire Emmy, and I had to decide, had enough passion transferred itself into my heart for me to continue. Because we'd done 16 mountains, but there were more. And I decided it had, and I couldn't stop even though at that point I was 69 years old. Well, I had a friend, and while I'm describing him, Andy Mishmash, and you can see him, and he looks like that spot on a frozen waterfall. He is an amazing climber. He's one of the really, really uh, terrific climbers uh, around. And there he is with uh, spikes on his feet called crampons with ice axe climbing a frozen waterfall. Now, this isn't what I was headed towards, but this is the kind of guy that I was going to recruit to help me, he was a very close friend, learn how to climb these big mountains. And we did. We went after the tougher mountains. Uh, these are, uh, some of these turn into rock climbs. That's Andy kind of looking uh, after me. And, and there I am going up another mountain and more, that's North Maroon Peak. And what were the naysayers saying? At this point, I was 70, 71. You're out of your effing mind. It certainly reinforces the notion that you are crazy. The only loose rocks are in your head. These are the kinds of statements that I was getting when I was trying to change time uh, comp share from time sharing into software. You can't do that. You can't. It's a completely different kind of company and so on. And the naysayers are out there and they have to be ignored. Some of our climbs actually did turn technical where we used their ropes and equipment. And I kept learning and I kept going and off we went. We even ran into some amazing things. Here's a wall we had to go up, and there are two goats. The two white things that you see in the middle are actually goats, a mama goat, and a, a, these are mountain goats, of course. They can climb anything. They're astonishing. And one goat on one of these mountains seemed to challenge me as to whether I could get up to summit along with him. And indeed, there is the goat at the summit of North Maroon Peak, which is a 14er. And he's actually standing on a rock that I wouldn't even stand on. Their balance is absolutely amazing. It was almost like having Emmy along with me that, uh, uh, you know, back in, in the form of a goat. I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna take you on a climb uh, and it is to a peak called Capital Peak. And this is, I'll finish with this story. On the left, you'll see the peak, it's way in the distance. 
Uh, it may look smaller than the one on the right, but it's not. It's a 14,000 foot peak. And if you can see the red at the line, that is uh, the route to get to the top of this peak. And it's a big, big climb, 5,300 feet worth of vertical, 17 miles worth of uh, 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 hiking, climbing, and, and backpacking. That little peak before the big one that you can see is called K2. Uh, it has to be summited to get to a very uh, a risky part of the climb, which I will be showing you. This is Andy Mishmash, got a big pack on his back because we were gonna do a, uh, a seven mile and 3000 foot hike backpack up to a lake where we were gonna set camp. So we could start very early in the morning the next morning, because this was gonna be a very long climb for me. In fact, it took me 17 hours worth of solid climbing. Uh, this is me following him. We eventually got into some snow. This was somewhat early in the summer around July 4th. And that's the mountain. Pretty intimidating to see from our campsite. This is the route that we were going to have to take. The first part that you see in, in red was the relatively easy part. Uh, we were going to do that in the dark. This is what it looks like in the light. And it is uh, about a thousand foot uh, a hike up to a saddle to start the, the more difficult bits. And you see the red part there is a huge, huge miles long boulder field that started off, and this is, this is indeed in the morning before sunrise. On the snow, uh, we've got uh, crampons and we've got an ice axe because if you slip on that stuff and you can't arrest yourself, uh, you're, you're, you're gonna die. It turns into this boulder field that went on forever. And that little point in the distance is just K2. Finally got there, had to summit K2. Problem with that is all those rocks are loose. So you have to climb it a different way. You can't pull, you have to push into the mountain to get up it. Then the next feature, once you get down the other side of K2 is a ridge and it's called the knife edge ridge. And it is what kills uh, it and, and, and the nearby area of this mountain is what kills so many people each year. The very dangerous 14er. This is me starting that knife edge, and what it is, it is literally um, a ridge that comes to a knife, almost a sharp point at the top, and it has a thousand foot drop off on both sides. This is what turns back many climbers. Uh, one way of climbing it is, is to hold on to the top and stick your feet in cracks going along the side. Another way is to try to straddle it like a horse, although that really, uh, 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 works the arms. I'm going to show you a, a short video of what it's like doing that. Uh, I'm going to the right place here. What you see in the distance uh, is the summit of Capitol Peak. So this knife edge ridge is a feature that needs to be traversed to even get to the bottom of the summit cone, which itself turns into another set of challenges. So as you can see, these mountains get to be uh, pretty challenging.
in hand. How you feeling? Feeling okay? Feeling okay with it? Uh, this is after getting through that knife edge, and there's still a lot more climbing to do to get to the summit of Capitol Peak. This is me at the summit being very excited about doing that. Um, so as, as it turns out, by the end of my climbing period, by the time I was 74 years old, and I'm 76 now, I had climbed all 58 of the 14,000 foot mountains in the Rockies and got a medal and a certificate of achievement from the Colorado Mountain Club. Uh, it, was, it was an amazing time to have uh, spent that last 10 years doing that. But I wanna make a few observations and that's the important part of this talk. And that is during the course of the 10 years that I spent roaming the mountaintops, I can say to you that, and that was from age 64 to age 74, they were the best 10 years of my life. Even with all the great things that had happened before, they were the best 10 years of my life. And just think about that, the possibility that from age 64 to 74 might be the best 10 years of your life. It's, it's a remarkable thing. And what does it take? What does it take for that to become true? And it takes a passion. It takes a way of taking yourself from wherever you currently are, whether it's at work and you're plodding one foot in front of the other, whether it's a major goal that has to be achieved, whether it's a transformation, it takes a passion and then it takes overcoming the challenges to achieve and to exercise that passion. And a few keys that I've learned. One is, and we're using the mountain as a metaphor now, you have to break out of your comfort zone. You have to ignore the naysayers. You have to lead with passion and don't quit. It is so critical not to quit because it turns out if you really can take the problem, break it down into pieces and, and just and move forward with strength, with energy and with passion, your passion can infect others and you can bring people along and inspire them because they're looking for somebody like a leader who is passionate, who is confident, who's going to solve the problems and who ignores the naysayers. And so if we treat this story of going after the mountains and setting a goal to do all 58 and accomplishing them and the way that it inspired others to help me do it, to come along with me to do it, it's, it's the same way that that little dog inspired me and I inspired others and we got it done. And that's my story. 